So in a previous video talking about the 1968 German Grand Prix, I mentioned that the 1968 season was a season of funerals. Jim Clark is probably the most famous one, well, maybe ever after Senna, I guess, but still, nothing compares to what happened at that year's French Grand Prix. Formula One was in a transitional phase. Wings started appearing on the cars. They were running unrestricted sponsorship. The colours of corporate entities were replacing the national colours of what came before, and suddenly the green lotuses were red and gold. Other teams would sell their souls to the corporate devils, and drivers were now making way more money than they ever had. But because Formula One had entered this aerodynamic age, there were still some issues to iron out. The wings that had been put on these cars broke. Aero stalled. But all the teams started working with them because it meant more cornering performance and faster lap times. By the end of the season, everybody was running them, and Lotus had their tall rear wing banned because, well, they just kept on breaking. And since this was also the era of the space race, supersonic jet fighters and stuff like that, I mean, Concord was only about, what, 12 months away at this time, the teams were all looking for this next technological advancement to get more and more performance out of the cars. And this, in a way, kind of irked the likes of Jackie Stewart and his mates because they were still pursuing the whole safety thing. The cars were getting faster and faster and faster, and they were getting faster, too fast, for the circuits to be able to keep up. One of those teams was Honda. Now, Honda had been in Formula 1 for a few years at this point, coming in at the start of the 1964 season. And the car for 1964 had been in development since 1962, and they were the first non-European manufacturer to come into Formula 1, before the likes of Eagle. While a Japanese outfit, they had two American drivers, and they were the only team other than Ferrari and BRM to build everything in-house, as opposed to building a car and then sourcing the engines like Lotus, Cooper and Vanwall did, you know, the garage easters. Honda became the first non-European team to win a Grand Prix event, taking the top step at the 1965 Mexican Grand Prix. That 1965 car was also quite different to the other cars on the grid, having a water-cooled transversely mounted V12 engine that could rev to 14,000 RPM. Now that might sound like nothing, considering we've seen F1 engines go up to 20,000 revs a minute, but in 1960s Formula 1, this was groundbreaking. Nobody could safely get the engine to that level. And that's the big thing here. The engine was safe to 14,000. It probably could have done more. But V12 gonna V12. It was heavy, and the chassis it was mated to was heavy as well. Honda also wasn't entering every race either. In 1966, it only entered 7 of the 10, and in 1967, it entered 7 of 11. But in the late season of 1967, the awful RA273 was replaced by the RA300, and it won the first race it entered, the 1967 Italian Grand Prix. And this is where John Surtees stood up on the top step. For this particular car, Honda had enlisted the help of Lola, so the car was jokingly called the Hondola, since it was no longer an all-Honda job. So going into 1968, Honda had something that might have worked well, but the new 301 was unreliable. The saving grace was, when it finished, it finished well, scoring a pole position and got on the podium at Rouen and Watkins Glen, and then had a fifth place at Brands Hatch. It didn't show up for South Africa, but it retired at Harama, Monaco, Spa, Zandvoort, the Nürburgring, Monza, where it got pole, and Mexico. A second car entered for David Hobbs at Monza also retired, while a one-off entry for Joe Bonnier finished fifth in Mexico. So, had it worked properly, it might have been moderately successful. But Honda, like Lotus, was trying to come up with a brand new wonder car so that it could do well in Formula 1. But like I said, V12s are heavy. The chassis that this V12 was mated to was also typically heavy, so why not strip all the weight out and have better power to weight ratios and, you know, a better handling car? I mean, that's what old man Chappers is doing up at Norfolk, right? So... There's got to be some sort of lightweight material that Honda could use to build a car with a better power to weight ratio. And that's what all the aircraft companies are doing, right? How hard can it be? It was going to be a little bit of a struggle. There were advancements being made in aerospace, but the people behind them had way deeper pockets and better connections. The United States Air Force had introduced the SR-71 Blackbird into service in 1966, and that was made out of titanium. Composite materials didn't exist at this point, and if they did, they were many expensive. The problem with the Blackbird was the CIA had to set up shell companies to buy the titanium from the Soviet Union so that Lockheed Martin at the Skunk Works could build the Blackbird. You know, this was the middle of the Cold War. And the other problem was, that plane didn't exist. At least, 
Officially, it didn't exist. Proper Black Ops stuff, I love it. Now this is the paragraph where I annoy an entire nation. Aluminium was the metal of choice for most teams. The Lotus 49 had an aluminium monocoque chassis for instance, and Chapman was stripping out the weight so much the car was just fragile. Honda needed something lighter than aluminium. Carbon was over a decade away. Titanium was too expensive. Beryllium was toxic. Lithium, sodium, potassium and cesium burst into flames when they came into contact with moisture and were just way too soft. But eventually, they found one that might work. Magnesium. Aluminium weighs 3.62 grams per cubic centimetre. Magnesium by comparison weighs 1.74 grams per cubic centimetre. What that is in ounces per cubic inch, you're going to have to do the conversions for yourself. As the Josh Bazell quote goes, how long does it take to boil a room temperature gallon of water? Answer is go fuck yourself because you can't equate any of the quantities. Anyway, TLDR is that magnesium is light and Honda could get some. So they went to the drawing board and came up with a brand new car, the Honda RA302. They even sacrificed development of the 301 so that they could get this thing out and start getting some results with what was hopefully a faster, more reliable car. The V12 was downgraded to a V8 as well to save weight, and the car was also air-cooled instead of being water-cooled. Again, weight saved. It produced about 430 horsepower as well, which might have put it on par with the Cosworth DFV. So all in with power to weight and all of that stuff, the Honda should have been on par with the Lotus 49. And Honda might have actually been onto something here. Why was everybody still using aluminium when they could use magnesium? Honda took the car to Silverstone for some shakedowns and a bit of testing. John Surtees got behind the wheel and took it out for a few laps to get the feel of it. And it was incredibly difficult to drive. In fact, it was unsafe, even by 1968 standards. Surtees took it back into the pit lane and Mr Nakamura, who was one of the Honda bosses, called Japan and said, this thing cannot race. Honda-san, on the other hand, was in France on business and at some point during that business trip, he was either convinced to run the 302 at the French Grand Prix or he decided himself that the 302 was going to run at the French Grand Prix. So what happened was Honda France entered this car into the French Grand Prix and Mr Nakamura and John Surtees didn't know about this until they turned up at the paddock on the Thursday or Friday morning at about 7.30, 8 o'clock and there was another white Formula One car with a red circle painted on the front of it. So the French Grand Prix that year was at Rouen. Rouen was a 5.5 kilometer road course that was a typical French road course. It was... It was basically the old spa, but was shorter and with tighter corners. But it had a modern pit lane separate from the track. It had a cobblestone hairpin of all things at Turn 4, and some blind corners to tackle. If you've watched GP laps historically, they did the pre-season race there, and it looks like a fun track in those old cars. But despite the cobblestone hairpin, which is just madness and the fact that it's public roads, it was quite a modern track by all accounts. Sadly, it's all gone now. It was shut in 1994 and all the grandstands and pit buildings were demolished and that cobbled hairpin has since been tarmac. The race weekend was already off to a shaky one. The F1 drivers were annoyed that the French racing authorities had prioritised the support races and despite saying practice would be 80 minutes long, it was only 60. At the last race at this track, the 1.5 litre cars had been lapping in the 202s. With the 3 litre cars, that time had shrunk to a 1 minute 56, with Joachim Rint being the fastest man out there. Surtees turned laps in his Honda, putting in a 158, while the other Honda could only do a 204. Surtees was 7th, the other Honda was 17th, second last on the grid. The other Honda was being driven by Joe Schlesser, a French driver who had been driving in Formula 2 and getting his first proper F1 race start. He'd entered the 1966 and 1967 German Grand Prix, but he'd done those races in a Formula 2 car. This was his first attempt at a race in a car built to the Formula 1 rulebook. And being a Frenchman, and this was Honda France entering the car, Schlesser was given the go-ahead to race. Race in a car that Surtees had called a potential death trap. Practice and qualifying was held on the Friday, so that on the Saturday there could be a lot of wine and cheese. That's not a joke, they actually had a day off for drinking and that sort of thing at the French Grand Prix. Remember when I did that video on the 1963 French Grand Prix and there were all those issues at the start because people didn't know what the hell was going on? The same thing happened here. The green flag dropped just as the cars were pulling into their grid boxes. So 
technically this race started as a rolling start and the French racing authorities were wondering why nobody liked the French Grand Prix. Stewart took the initial lead, but the back end of the circuit was wet and Jackie X managed to get into the lead instead, because he'd had the big brain moment to put on dedicated wet tyres. It then started to rain more, and X, like Stewart at the Nürburgring, was in the prime position. But behind them, after completing just two laps, Schlesser went off the road at turn three. He slid up an embankment, rolled the car, the car landed upside down, the fuel tank split, the fuel went onto the hot exhaust, and the car, the fuel, and Schlesser went up. Yes, the car went up in flames, not just the fuel. And how did that even happen? Well, at school, I'm sure as part of your chemistry lessons, your teacher ignited a piece of magnesium over a Bunsen burner and told you to be careful about staring at it because magnesium burns bright white. It was essentially the same concept, just bigger. The magnesium car burned so ferociously, the fire crews which had been on the scene in seconds had to wait for the magnesium to burn itself out before they could get the fire under control, which took them another five laps or so to complete. Yes. Laps. Not minutes. Laps. They didn't stop the race. The drivers carried on driving by as Schlesser was incinerated in his own car. Today, various parts of F1 cars are made out of magnesium, particularly the wheel hubs, and that might get you wondering why those never catch fire. It's because they're massive chunks of magnesium. The Honda was made out of thin magnesium panels. When an F1 car hits a wall with the wheel first, say at Monaco, Singapore or the Wall of Champions at Canada, you'll see these bright sparks fly off as little bits of the magnesium are taken off and ignite from the friction. Because the actual hubs are thick chunks of the stuff, they don't burst into flames from the heat of the brakes. Something to do with surface area, I guess. It would actually be interesting to see a scale model of that Honda built out of magnesium and then set on fire. You know, douse it in lighter fluid, light it, film it in slow motion, you know, get Gavin and Dan on that kind of thing. It would be a, a, a neat little thing to watch for historical purposes. The combination of the magnesium and the fuel was so hot the tarmac melted. Bits of Honda were strewn across the track and Rint had to pit after a piece of metal was found embedded in one of his tyres. Joe Siffert and Servoz Gavin were lucky to not be collected by the Honda and once that Honda was finally cleared the drivers could speed up in that little section of the track. Later on in that race a piece of the Honda was flicked up and hit Surtees in the face, cracking the lens of one of his goggles in a case of turbo irony. It's thought the Honda caused several punctures that day, causing more issues when another sudden downpour occurred around lap 19 that caused Ix to slide wide and briefly hand the lead to Rodriguez. Ix got the lead back and he won ahead of Surtees in the other Honda, while in third it was Stewart a lap down. It wasn't until after the race the drivers learned who was in the car that caught fire at the side of the track at turn 3. Now Schlesser had a friend in French motorsport, that man was called Guy Ligier or Guy Ligier, I think is actually pronounced in French. Now Ligier would get himself involved in building racing cars and every single chassis he built was christened JS and then a number, such as JS 43, which is the car that won the 1996 Monaco Grand Prix. The JS in those Ligier chassis is named for Joe Schlesser. The win, which was his first, put Ix into second in the driver's standings while Graham Hill kept the lead despite not finishing that race. Hill would ultimately win the 1968 championship, having rescued the morale of the Lotus team following Jim Clark's death. But this particular race will be forever remembered for the death of a driver in a car that should not have been anywhere near a racetrack. So then, a look at the 1968 French Grand Prix and the story of the Death Trap Magnesium Honda. If you've learned something new here today, then do give the video a like so that the algorithm can do algorithmy things. And, you know, obviously subscribe and get that bell on if you're new here and want to see more. Massive thanks to the kind folk over at Patreon for the continued support. And if you want to help out with the buying up of images to be used in these videos, you can do so by heading to the link in the description, where there's also links to Discord and to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.